Pentecost Sunday, which we will talk about in the sermon. As you can tell, we have red paraments and a red stole today, and um, we use red for Pentecost Sunday, Reformation Sunday, and also Saints Sunday is when they appear on a sun, uh, Saints Days when they appear on Sundays. Uh, Frank, our temporary church administrator, has resigned because of health uh, reasons. Um, he will continue to help with the transition and finding a permanent person. Frank has been outstanding in his capacity with the uh, helping in the church office and all the other work he does. He's been an asset to the church as well as to me. We pray for his recovery and his strength at this time. I hope these video services are a blessing to you during this pandemic uh, time we are going through. Bulletins to assist with you participating in the service were mailed last week and um, you should have them by now. Also, I'd like to announce that the Window Replacement Capital Campaign Project will begin on June 1st. Uh, and I, we appreciate your support of the capital campaign funds as well as your regular offerings. First lesson today is from Acts 2, 1 to 21, and not the Corinthians that was noted in your bulletin. Your stewardship response, as I said, has been greatly appreciated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with a whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day. O oh God, on this day you opened the hearts of your faithful people by sending to us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit, that we may have a right judgment in all things, and rejoice at all times in your peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts second chapter verses 1 to 21 when the day of Pentecost had come they were all together in one place and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and the tongue rested on each of them all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at the sound of a, 
And at this the sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard from themselves speaking in native languages to each others. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all they who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading is from the seventh chapter of uh, John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our school children, as you know, are home. They're not at school, they're home sheltering and uh, using laptops and um, have lessons from their teachers. What is this going on? Nine, ten weeks already? Just amazing to many of us as adults that they can do this. But I want to share with you something I read. A number of years ago, the United States Department of Education surveyed 1,500 middle school students across the country to determine what they liked and disliked about middle school when they were in school. As you might guess, their list of dislikes far outnumbered the list of what they liked. The boys liked the girls. The girls liked the boys. That was pretty much, that was pretty much in on the uh, like side. On the dislike side, they hated the food. The lectures uh, were boring. The homework was too hard. And the desks were uncomfortable. And as I read that survey, I thought to myself that 
Some people say the same thing about church. That is when we were attending church and being in church regularly. It's true that we like the boys and the girls here. They are our friends. But for some beyond that, it's not that much to like about the church. Pastors have heard these complaints for years that the lectures are boring and our, and our homework is doing the Ten Commandments, which is too hard. And nobody really likes the taste of communion wafers, even though we cannot wait for when we have communion now. And even the padded pews cause bleach your, buff, blah, butt, bleach your butt after a while. And yet many of us will be loving, we love when we uh, can come back and sit on these pews. So there you have it. Church is like middle school. This morning, at the risk of treating you like middle school students, I have prepared a teaching sermon. It's not my typical style, I know, but I think it's necessary today on Pentecost Sunday to understand its significance. The day God sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And because many of us know so little about the Holy Spirit, I decided to share with you what I do know. Forty days after Jesus rose from the grave, on that first Easter, he departed from the earth and ascended into heaven. But just before he left, he commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They didn't even, uh, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit meant. Uh, did they even have any idea what the Holy Spirit does? I would say that the same questions would be asked of us today. So here goes. You are my seventh and eighth graders, sitting at home in your rocking chair. You don't have to sit up straight like you would in school. You don't have to keep your hands to yourself. You could drink coffee or tea and learn. And there will be a test. Ten days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were gathered in one place and they were waiting. And then suddenly, there was a noise that enveloped the whole uh, room. It, sound, it felt like a, a mighty wind, like, uh, like a storm they never experienced before. Flames danced around them, but there was no fire. And then perhaps the, the strangest phenomenon happened. They began to speak. The disciples began to speak in languages that they themselves had never learned and could not understand. What they did know is that the God, God uh, had a purpose in this chaos. Because just outside the windows and the streets, they were filled with foreigners. And you heard the list, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Egyptians, Asians, visitors from every part of the world. They had all come to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of weeks. Of weeks. But this was not some coincidence. It was a creative solution of the Holy Spirit because for the first time, people were hearing about Jesus in their own native languages. The Asians heard their, in their language, the Spanish heard it in their language, the Africans heard it in their language, and the gospel was shared with people from all over the world. And when the bystanders accused the disciples of being drunk, Peter defended them by saying, we're not drunk, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. And then he continued. Peter, this simple, um, bumbling fisherman, began quoting from the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet. He said, people of Judea and residents of Jerusalem, 
What is happening here is what the prophet Joel spoke of. That in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young people shall see visions. And your old people shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you, know, you need to know that there are various interpretations as what Pentecost means. For our charismatic brothers and sisters, Pentecost is about speaking in tongues, those strange languages that the disciples spoke at that time. Charismatics or Pentecostals, as they are called, believe that speaking in tongues is a sure and certain sign that someone has the Holy Spirit within them. And if one does not speak in, in tongues, well, that says the person is not possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's why some Christians go through some great emotional contortions trying to speak in tongues as if to prove they have the Holy Spirit. But I ask you, is this the point of Pentecost? It's got to be more than that. Coming back 10 days to the ascension and Jesus' words to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and even to the remote parts of the earth. Uh-huh. The point of Pentecost was to give the church a mission. And the mission was to go and tell. It is one thing to gather as a family and friends on the comfort of a morning service worship as we did 10 weeks ago and as we will be doing again. But we have to come out of the box because we are called to be bold and creative. And it calls me to set aside religious language that becomes comfortable as a pastor preaching all these years because my audience might not understand the words that we use like liturgy, absolution, Eucharist, uh, transubstantiation. For you it might require telling God's love with our hands instead of just our voices, by feeding the needy, by gathering children, uh, school kits in third, for third world countries and God's work, our hands projects as we had, uh, or bringing canned goods for the outreach center, uh, blankets for the needy. Pentecost brought the first disciples to people they didn't like very much. Let me repeat that. Pentecost brought the first disciples to people they didn't like very much, like the Samaritans, for example, and slaves and young people and women and Roman soldiers. Pentecost might require 21st century disciples to show God's love to the nasty co-worker or the rude customer we meet at the Redners or Target or the crabby neighbor that doesn't smile. And why? Because Pentecost requires us to build bridges between the Church of Grace and the, church, and the world of hopelessness. The Church of Jesus was intended for all who call upon the name of the Lord. Something I learned years ago, that if you want to really speak to teenagers, you have to understand that teenagers are like islands. Teenagers are like islands. And you have to row around the island until you find the spot where to land. You don't start where you are with your agenda and your advice by telling them what they should do and shouldn't do. You have to start where, where their interests are. What are their thoughts? What are their ideas? What are their questions? 
And it's not only true of teenagers, I think it's true of all of us. Nobody wants to be just preached at. I struggle with those who sense their calling is to stand on the street corners and tell people they are sinners and they need to straighten up and fly right or they will go to hell. The call to Pentecost is to go and develop relationships with people around us, wherever they are, to live out our faith, to show our faith, and over time to earn the right to share your faith with others. But most importantly, we don't do it alone. The Holy Spirit is there to sustain us and be with us, to comfort us, especially when we feel our lives are upside down like it is today, guiding us when we feel we can't find the way, and interceding for us when we don't even know how to pray. The Holy Spirit does not make his way to us in mighty winds or fire on the shoulder or speaking in tongues but maybe it's in the still, quiet voice of God in our lives, reminding us that he is with us always, even during difficult times of our lives, especially during difficult times of our lives. That much is what we know about the Holy Spirit, and that's enough. So we go, live, show, and tell. The Spirit gives us power. Thanks be to God. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and in all places, praying for the church, the world, and all in need. We call on your spirit of life present in, uh, in air, wind, humanity, humidity, storms, oxygen in our atmosphere, breathing energy into all things. Heal with your breath the whole creation, especially those who struggle to breathe due to air pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of righteousness. Wherever we as a people are divided, unite us. Wherever we are prideful, humble us. Give each one of us a heart of justice and empathy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of healing. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, chaplains, counselors, hospice workers, as they care for those in need. We pray for all who belong, who, who, who long for comfort especially for those we name in our hearts and out loud for Frank. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your, on your spirit of friendship as Elizabeth welcomed Mary to her home. Give us the spirit of welcome to those whom we meet in our congregation and outside our doors. Surprise us daily with unexpected grace that we may rejoice in every blessing you send, Lord, in your mercy. We pray, for, Lord, for an end of this pandemic. We pray for those afflicted in body and spirit, especially for those who are stricken with this virus, that the hearts 
would neither be troubled nor afraid, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. We pray that you bring healing to those who are possessed by this virus in their lives and support those who, uh, family members of those who have died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of hope. As you have led your saints in all times and places, stir in us the desire to follow their example, leading us from death to new life in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>